losses, only two of them going head to head. Arizona and USC. Sam Clancy, nine straight double doubles, the longest active streak in America coming in, Andy. Well, I don't want to give it away, but let's make it 10. Clancy <laughs> was unstoppable here. He also has played 40 minutes in three straight games. He's making a case for Pac-10 Player of the Year with this kind of inside-out game that he's displaying right here. That went over Luke Walton, Trojans by a dozen. Jason Gardner went 14 minutes to start the game without scoring, but late in the half, drains the three, and of course, Digger, the catch, is going to go to him to get some more. Jason Gardner has the momentum to make things happen. Corner three, gets it down. So they had to go up one in it. Sequence, come back to him again. 27 points, Arizona up 66-62. David Blumenthal, get that out, 21 points in the last four games. He ended up with 31, playing all 40 minutes, 23 in the second half. No longer in the doghouse, especially when he hit this kind of shot in front of the bench. The 31, a career high, and he had a big game against Arizona State as well on Thursday. He said he took about 1,000 shots to get ready for that. Clancy, thank you very much. 28 points. SC up by four. Late in the second half, under 30 ticks. Gardner putting moves on Clancy, and it looked as if a, a typical South L.A. mugging right there, and Luke couldn't find a cop anywhere willing to make a charge. Gus Passner a little bit upset, too, I believe, Andy. A lot of people upset. Salim Stoudemire is going to chase down the ball in the corner. He, too, is going to feel contact. He does not care. Right in Bluthenthal's mug. Arizona down by two. Three-point game. Gardner for the tie in overtime. Gardner for the tie, and we are going to overtime. Oh, no, we're not. Did he move his pivot foot? I'm going to watch the spot shadow and see. I. Oh, you got to call that. Picked it up. Not in South Bend. We mean not in South Bend. You Trust think you me. always get those calls Absolutely. at home? Absolutely. Well, he was on the road, so that's why. USC wins the game 94-89. Arizona started the weekend in first. They dropped to a tie for fifth with UCLA in the loss column with five losses, similar to what happened to Oregon when they lost two on the road. Credit Henry, Henry Bibby for benching Blumenthal for the game the other night. Gets him started off the bench, gets it done today by starting that lineup, 31 big points. So the Cats go 0 for LA in their trip. Uh, we'll detail where the Pac-10 stands and who might have an upper hand as we progress on in the show. Arizona State and UCLA. UCLA coming off that scintillating win over the Cats on Thursday night. Cedric Bozeman's been struggling. The freshman, Gadzooks! And get Zurich's Bruins down six after the free throw. Later in the half, Sun Devils get loose. Jason Braxton will throw it down. Devils up by six. Chad Pruitt was on the not hot panel on Sports Center on Friday night because he'd only been averaging like seven points a game in his last two roadies. Maybe he got ill, Digger. No, but he hits this big three, gets fouled also. But the fact is this, gets a big block in Gadzurik. Pruitt had 22 in this game. He had 22 in a game before that they lost by three to the Bruins. And once again, Pruitt, that one to tie the game. 22, as Digger mentioned, we're locked up at 66, under 20 ticks to go. Curtis Millich. You know, sometimes those left-handed guys just look smooth. 11 points for Millage, Arizona State for the first time in 15 years. They win at Pauley Pavilion. UCLA struggling with Billy Knight going two for eight. Jason Capone three for seven. If they're not scoring, they're not going to win games, especially at home. How about a big red at Pauley Pavilion? Sound familiar? Yeah, big red who? Not a walk. walk. Yeah, act like you don't remember him. You remember him, okay? Arizona State, meanwhile, now just a game under 500 in the Pac-10. At RPI and strength, the schedule's not good, guys. So, but you know, it's a quality road win now. Well, in the non-league, they had one top 50 non-league win. It was early in the year against Utah at number 18. Bottom line is Arizona State has to take care of business. They're gonna have to win at Arizona. They're gonna have to sweep Cal and Stanford at home and win a couple games in the Pac-10 tourney. Arizona State is certainly not going to be this year's Georgia. The RPIs think the schedule not good enough. Georgia has no worries right now, taking on Kentucky in the SEC. Steve Thomas, back from that suspension, he gives the dogs an inside presence. Dick. Here's why. Watch him work. Out of bounds play, gets a baseline jumper, but follows it. Kentucky doesn't box out. He takes it right, right back up, puts it inside. Again, how about a little defense? No. Give him this. I'll block it. Two. Both ends of the floor. In the paint, makes things happen. Fast break for shot right. Takes it up, gets it in. Game tied at 32 at this point. And Thomas, who started that whole thing, finished with 16 points and 12 boards. Second half, Cats down by one. Marquise Estel, the hook will not bring you back if you leave it that short. Jarvis Hayes baptizing everybody in blue. 37-34. Dogs on top.
Bulldogs up six. Ezra Williams, who had an outstanding game to steal. Rashad Wright. Dogs stretch it out to eight. Now it's a five-point spread. I want you to check out the spot shadow. Williams in the wing. He is guarded by Tayshawn Prince. Move the ball. Move the ball. Make it happen. Back door. Nice read by Kentucky and a high post feed. 61-54. More offensive execution for Harris Dogs. This is right with the ball. He's number one. Chris Daniels, who was suspended for the first half of this game. Second guy to touch it. Ezra's going to get it. He's number three. And you like everybody to touch the ball for the dog digger. When you move the ball without dribble, you get layups inside by just passing it around. He was open on the inside. Kentucky standing flat-footed. Easy two points. Thomas would finish it up. Every dog touching on that possession. Everybody except Alec Kessler, Stinky Daniels, and Vern Fleming. Rashad Wright finishing it off for the first time in 15 years. The dogs sweep Kentucky for the season. 78-69 the final. Not in the box score. Once again, the inconsistent season of Keith Fogans. He was 2 for 10 for 5 points. In his last 5 games, he's had 2 5-point outings since he scored 20 against Florida. And put Cliff Hawkins in that same category. He goes 2 for 10 today. That does not work. They need both of those guys to play to get their offense going, especially on the road. Nezra Williams with 20 points. He's still grieving the death of his brother who was shot in Atlanta last week. Said what his brother would want him to do, and he wasn't going to let the dogs lose the game. Moving on in the SEC, Florida and Ole Miss. Rod Barnes, this team has been very tough at home, and Florida was really struggling early on, especially Brett and Nelson in. Yeah, he really was. And this is some of the problems that Billy Donovan has had with Nelson and Justin Hamilton at that point guard position. They have not had consistent point guard play. They get a side on who's going to play that position, Coach. I think Brett held the ball so long there for a while he decided it was okay to go ahead and dribble it again. Aaron Harper knocks down the three, and David Sanders is going to work and go over Matt Bonner. Another big red. Ole Miss up by five at the break. We mentioned Nelson's difficult afternoon for a normally pure shooter digger. He just couldn't get anything started. Couldn't get off a steal. Look at this. Hamilton comes down, makes a miss, and rejection there. He misses a big three when you need it. He goes 0 for 9 in the field today. No points for Nelson in Florida's letdown against Mississippi. Billy might want a little stiffer drink than that water by the end of this thing. Harper knocking down the long three. The Rebels were devastating from behind the arc. 10 of 24. Good. Rebels up by eight. Bonner trying to create a little offense with the defense. Very lazy pass by Ole Miss there. Haslam he only had three field goals. Put one in there. And a little 5-5 spark plug. Floor burns for Jason Harrison. Harper would finish it off. He had 18 points, and Ole Miss hammers Florida 68-51. to The Rebel D holds the Gators to the lowest offensive output of the Billy Donovan era. Credit David Sanders and Justin Reed. Both guys double-double really bothered Florida today in the paint. Florida, 17.6% from three-point land, just 29% from anywhere. Ole Miss probably safe. Their RPI probably not as good as you would expect, but they have some quality wins in a tough league. But you know what? They weren't safe before today. Getting this win over Florida, number eight in the RPI, really helps them because prior to that, their best win in the non-conference was over Memphis. It's 56. Yes, they swept Arkansas and beat Mississippi State, but they didn't have a quality win before Florida. Alabama leading the SEC could add a game to its lead on Florida for the over all lead taking on Tennessee in Tuscaloosa. Vincent Yarbrough, Marcus Hayslip. Hayslip is a guy who's really raised his game since Ron Slay's been hurt. Yes, he has. He's played very well in this game. Got a lot of things done. Offensive rebound, getting a slam, making things happen when he knows how to score in the paint up and under. Gets it done. 20 points in the first half for Hayslip. Hayslip also can take it outside. That was deep. That one was from Northport. Tennessee still down by six at the break in the second half. Alabama, they couldn't have hit sand if they were standing on the beach. Terrence Meade, wide open from three, misses it. Grizzard would take a crack at it for the tide. He carried Alabama against South Carolina in that comeback win. Rod couldn't get that one. Kenny Walker couldn't get the foul. And the sharp shooting freshman, Ernest Shelton, three-pointer, new. Alabama missed his first 13 shots of the second half, but then Demetrius Smith. See the three, B, the three, and then Irwin Dudley going to work. Dudley getting half 16 big points. I love what Alabama brought to the table when they need it. 
getting it up and down, making it go. Five guys in double figures, 20 points off 15 Tennessee turnovers. When it counted, they came through. I think Mark Goffrey has got to be the SEC coach of the year. Erwin Dudley, 25 points, had the assist there, and Alabama getting a lot of productions. In fact, Mo Williams, the freshman point guard, nearly messed around, got himself a triple-double. He was just three rebounds short, 11 points, 10 dimes and seven boards, a couple of steals for good measure in the tide. Now up by two games on Florida for the overall SEC lead, but the case is Tennessee. If you're going to go deep into this conference for tournament bids, how about Illinois on the road as Seton Hall stepping out of Big Ten play. Frank Williams showing up a little bit, much maligned Frank Williams. Yes, he is. His leadership is there, making it with the threes. Gets it done, 14 big points in that first half coming off the threes that he does with consistency. And when he's open and he's in the rhythm, he gets it done. Credit Lucas Johnson with six assists in this game. Fine people. I know that you're always going to find a way to credit Lucas Johnson if you can. He's one of your guys right there. Williams, those 14 at Illinois, up by four this late in the first half. There's Williams. Right there at the end, of Ryan Cook had a big day as well. Illinois had a 15-point lead at the break. Seton Hall trying to come back. They got Andre Barrett spinning and driving. Pirates down by 10. But Brian Cook emerged, Dan. Well, you know, he was benched for the first five and a half minutes of the game. He ended up with 23 and 15. He had 22 against Michigan State. Brian Cook finally playing with confidence and authority. That could be the difference in this team going deeper in the tournament. Those 23 and 15, both season highs. Illinois won four in a row, three of those on the road, the 10-point victory there. Back in the Big Ten play, Buckeyes and Iowa, the Hawkeyes playing without Reggie Evans. Leading rebounder, second leading scorer. Steve Alford benched all five starters, in fact. He used five reserves to start the game. Sean Sonderleiter averaging two a game, driving in there, gets his own rebound. Six in the first half for Sean. Iowa up by seven. Then it's a man named Brody. Brody Boyd from the top of the key at 11 in the first half. Hawkeyes by four. Steve Alford benched Reggie Evans because of disciplinary and trying to restore a little order in. Yeah, he did. Uh, Reggie Evans missed a class last week, played him against Penn State, and Steve Alford regretted it. Yeah, and 16-5 run, Ohio State went on to start the second half. Luke Recker would strip Brian Brown and hit the deck and gets all bloody. Missed most of the end of the game because of that when they suffered that cut. He had three points on the day. OSU down three, Brown showing some quickness in there, Digger, and Brian Brown strong. Strong inside, making it happen when you need the points in the paint. Played solid for Jimmy O'Brien in the paint and he kicked it out to Savovich too nicely Savovich draining the three Buckeyes had a five-point lead Savovich this time won't get the three to go down Ryan Hogan coming up with the rebound and he'll turn it over and Savovich is there to put it home 15 points for him Darby matched that 72 to 66 the Buckeyes who have that tough road stretch lost the first couple they win this one they're at Indiana on Wednesday night now the slide for Iowa really began January 5th when they played Ohio State in Columbus in Boston College, the reigning Big East champion. Second half, UConn down four to Leek Brown and Tony Robertson. I mean, three of 23 in his last four games. He had 19 in this one. Ryan Sidney and his headband causing havoc for the Husky stick. He makes things happen. When you get Sidney open, he can go anywhere he wants. One on one, reads it. Watch the switch. Should have switched and that didn't make it happen. Took it in for a big score. Again, unreal. Got a little distracted there, did Sidney, and Robertson went right by him. Game tied at 55. Troy Bell coming up with a play. Sidney getting some redemption. As you mentioned, he can score in a lot of different ways. And then Talik Brown takes a lot of heat, but he made some tough plays. He did here. This game actually mirrored Talik Brown's career. Was not that effective earlier in the game, but he stayed with it defensively, especially being opportunistic. Scoring here consecutive trips down the court to really help this team win. Sydney going in there and getting his shot blocked, as many do when you try to take it in against Emeka Okafor, who had nine blocks in this game. The Hartford Civic Center electric as Karan Butler goes in, and UConn is up by two. They've been down by ten with two and change left. And then here's Bell going baseline, and even in Hartford, he gets the call. So Troy's going to go to the line. He has to make both to push this thing into overtime. The first one, money. Second one, ice. We go to overtime, tied at 73 in the OT. BC's down one. Bell's three-pointer rattles around, won't go. UConn running. This is when they've been their most effective. Ben Gordon 
fouled by Sidney, called intentional, just a horrible call. Yeah, Al Skinner was very upset after the game with that call. BC had one last chance, even so after UConn missed free throws. They were dreadful at the line, didn't get a shot off. 79-77, Calhoun wins it. I got to pick the MVP of that game. I thought Talik Brown, UConn's down 10 with 2.47 to go. He gets 10 points on the 14-5 run to put him up 73-71 regulation. Without that impact, they don't win this game. But he shouldn't do the talking. He, Ryan City and Troy Bell, too much talking in this game. Okay, but what about BC's resume now for the uh, Big Dance? They think they're in if they can win 20, but the, some of those numbers are kind of in that twilight zone. Yeah, it's going to be an elimination in the Big East. They've got four games left. If they go 3-1, and one, it will be against quality teams, though because they still got to go to St. John's Monday. They go to home, host Villanova, host Connecticut, and then at Syracuse. But that RPI, you know, being an undertaker, son, my father was RIP a lot. But I, I they, these RPIs don't make sense to me a lot of times because I don't think right now BC has got that strength the way they've been playing the last two weeks, losing games like the Virginia Tech on the road as well as Providence on the road. Let me clear it up for you, Digger. If BC doesn't win some more top 25 games, they will be RIP or NIT. Maybe